Well, I don't know if you've done your bracket yet or not, but we're in the middle of March Madness. And sadly, our University of Memphis Tigers lost badly yesterday. What's always interested me about March Madness and major sports events like that is the fickle nature of fans. Win and you're a hero. Lose and you're the villain. Win and the cheers are galore. Lose and the condemnation is abundant. I don't know if you know the name John Huffman or not, but he's a retired Presbyterian minister who for many years served as a chaplain uh, to a variety of NFL football teams. And he got to know several of the quarterbacks in the National Football League, among them Terry Bradshaw. You know, of course, the name Terry Bradshaw. He's now a sportscaster, retired, Hall of Fame football player, played for the Pittsburgh Steelers for 13 years. His number 12, they say, will never be worn again as a tribute to what he brought to the Steelers and to the city of Pittsburgh. Well, Terry Bradshaw confided in Reverend Huffman quite often the fickle nature of the Pittsburgh Steelers fans. And he told about an occasion when he, after a game which the Steelers had lost and wherein he had played badly, that he went the next day to a service station to get some gas. He got his gas. He went in and paid for the gas. He came out to get in his car to leave. And after he got into his car and was about to drive off, he noticed two teenagers who were running toward him, uh, toward his car, and they were waving their hands as, as if to stop him. And so he stopped. He rolled down his window expecting uh, them to ask for his autograph. And they spit in his face. Fans can be quite fickle, can't they? Well, Jesus certainly knew the fickle nature of the fans on that first Palm Sunday. Here they were by the thousands. Thousands. Scholars don't know for sure how many people gathered on the roadway coming to Jerusalem that day, but it could easily have been somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000, perhaps more. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us there were two million people in Jerusalem on that Passover, and so it's not beyond measure to believe that there easily could have been upward to 100,000 people lining the streets of Jerusalem, and they're shouting His name, and they're calling Hosanna. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Children are waving, and children are shouting His name. And they're, they're laying their cloaks in the roadway and, and they're spreading palm branches in the roadway, even as some wave them. All of that a sign of royalty. Hosanna. Blessed are you. Blessed are you, dear Messiah. And yet in just five short days, many of that same crowd will be shouting something other than Hosanna. They will be shouting, free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Pilate gives them a choice. Whom would you condemn this day, Barabbas or this Jesus? Free Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Well, what got Jesus killed? That's the question for this Palm Sunday. What got Jesus killed? Well, it's simple. He wouldn't change to fit the crowd. He remained in Jerusalem who he had been all his life in ministry. He stayed true to what he believed, what he had taught, and who he was. And it got him killed. Let me suggest three things. Jesus continued to teach that we see the good in everyone. And it got him killed. Jesus continued to teach that we see the good in everyone. Some of you know that I receive daily a, an email titled, This Day in History. You may do the same. And so each day I get an email telling about some historic event or uh, some historic person, typically an anniversary. And on this past February the 27th, I received uh, This Day in History email about the 10th anniversary of the death of Fred Rogers. You know Fred Rogers? Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He was on television for 31 years, amazing. Many of you know that he was a Presbyterian minister. Many of you may not know that. You want to know why this Presbyterian minister considered television his calling? Let me tell you what he said. 
I got into television because I saw people throwing pies at each other's faces. And that to me was such demeaning behavior. And if there's anything that bothers me, it's one person demeaning another. That really angers me. The reason this Presbyterian minister got into television because he was tired of seeing human beings demean one another. And demeaning one another certainly was alive and well in Jesus' day. First of all, the Jews hated the Romans. I mean hated the Romans. Hated them. It was an occupation. This foreign army had come in and taken over their land. They were occupied. Remember Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, the musical of the 70s? There's this scene on Palm Sunday where the zealots in the crowd sing this as Jesus rides the donkey into Jerusalem. There must be over 50,000 screaming love and more for you. And every one of 50,000 would do whatever you ask him to. Keep them yelling their devotion, but add a touch of hate at Rome. You will rise to greater power. We will win ourselves a home. If Jesus had just hated the Romans, the Jews might not have shouted, crucify him. But the Romans despised the Jews. They considered them trash. And the Jews detested Gentiles. And thus the Gentiles detested the Jews. And the Pharisees felt like everybody was beneath them. And if you couldn't live up to the law the way they lived up to the law, then they spiritually demeaned you. And the rich looked down on the poor, and the poor distrusted the rich, and on and on the list goes. The Jews hated the Romans, and the Romans hated the Jews, and the Jews hated the Gentiles, and the Gentiles hated the Jews, and the rich hated the poor, and the Pharisees didn't like anybody. And what did Jesus do? Right in the middle of that, He dares to say, love your neighbor. He dares to talk about the virtue of kindness. He dares to talk about avoiding judgmentalism. I mean, talk about a way to get killed. In the middle of that kind of demeaning hate to talk about loving your neighbor, seeing the good in somebody else, practicing kindness toward the person you hate that you can't stand, avoiding judging the other person. Well, what about us? What about us on this side of the crucifixion? Any demeaning going on here? Any racial demeaning? Ethnic demeaning? Gender demeaning? Political demeaning? Let's face it. On this side of the crucifixion, are we that different than the crowd that turned on Him? Remember that old gospel song, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Well, yes, we are. When we demean other human beings. When we're unloving. When we're unkind. Secondly, Jesus continued to expand the reach of God's grace. In Jerusalem, as throughout His ministry, He continued to expand the reach of God's grace. The Pharisees and the religious authorities of Jesus' day didn't mind talking about forgiveness. They didn't mind talking about God's grace as long as you were talking about forgiving the righteous. As long as you were talking about God's grace and God's mercy made available to those who kept the law. As long as you were talking about God's grace and God's mercy available to those who walked the straight and narrow. Oh, we don't have a problem with talking about God's grace. We don't have a problem talking about God's forgiveness as long as... It's the righteous, the clean. But grace for blatant sinners, you've got to be kidding. Mercy for the overtly immoral? Come on now. Forgiveness available for one who doesn't follow the law? Absolutely not. One of the most revealing scenes in all the Gospels is found in John 8. And you know this scene. Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem. And while he's teaching, and there's a large crowd gathered around him, and while he's teaching, the Pharisees bring a woman who's been caught in adultery into the circle where Jesus is teaching. And he's surrounded by a crowd, and they thrust the woman who's been caught in adultery, I mean, literally caught in adultery, 
Not speculated that she'd been caught in adultery, says John. And they thrust the woman to the ground in front of Jesus and they say, the law says that we should stone her to death. What do you say? You're the great teacher. What do you say? The law says stone her. She's committed adultery. We caught her doing it. What do you say? Well, if he says stone her, then he breaks the law of compassion. It's almost a no-win situation. If he says don't stone her, then he breaks the Jewish law. And they've got him. Remember what Jesus does? He writes in the scene. Never says a word. Never says a word in this scene until later with the woman. He simply bends down and writes in the sand. While they're saying, what would you do? The law says stone her to death. She's caught in adultery. What would you do? He writes in the sand. And then he points. They're gathered in a circle, stones in their hands, arms ready. She deserves it. Blatant sinner. Scarlet letter woman. Law says. Okay. Do it. Just do it. The one of you without sin, and scholars say that what Jesus wrote in the sand were the sins of them and the sins of us. So the one of you who's never needed God's grace, the one of you who's never needed forgiveness, the one of you who's been perfect, the one of you who's never committed one of these sins, hey, go ahead. Do it. You have a right to stone her if you've never, ever needed God's grace. If you've never, ever needed God's forgiveness, if you've never, ever needed God's mercy, hey, go ahead, stone her. The one of you who's never needed God's mercy, throw that stone. You know what happens? One by one by one by one, the stones drop to the ground and the crowd leaves. And Jesus says to the woman, where are they who would condemn you? And she says, they've gone. And then he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And others now go and get it right. Well, how are we doing in that? How are we doing when it comes to God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness available to all people, not just the righteous, but blatant sinners, not just the clean, but the overtly immoral? How are we doing? this side of the crucifixion? Well, not too well, according to some. You know what the fastest growing segment of the religious uh, culture in the United States of America is? The nuns. Not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S. And you know that from the Pew Research Center who's done this study for years. The fastest growing segment of the religious culture in the United States of America are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which means they have no connection whatsoever to established religion, no connection whatsoever to the established church, no connection whatsoever to any established religion. And you know the number one reason that the fastest growing segment of the religious culture in this country are the nuns. And by the way, 20% of the American people consider themselves a nun. And listen to this, one-third, this is compelling, one-third of all young adults, 30 years of age and under, one-third are nuns. One-third of all young adults, 30 years of age, are nuns, and the number is growing. It has tripled, that number has tripled in the last 20 years. The number one reason that the nuns are the fastest growing segment of the religious culture of the United States of America is that they consider the church and institutional religion to be judgmental, to be condemning of lifestyles that bother us, to be judgmental of people whom we consider morally bankrupt, to castigate and limit God's grace if your sin's too big. Interesting thing how, how it is with us human beings. It's true of preachers too, by the way. We know this, sadly. Have you noticed how we minimize our sins and maximize everybody else's? I warrant God's grace, but you don't. 
My sin's here, your sin's here. That's not what Jesus taught, is it? Good way to get yourself killed is to remind folks who don't want to be forgiving that they need to be forgiving and that God's grace wraps everyone. Thirdly, Jesus continued to talk about a cross. Jesus continued to talk about a cross. The disciples were a little bothered when he talked about loving your enemies, but they could get over that. They were a little bothered when he talked about having to learn to love the Gentiles, but they figured they could get over that. What they couldn't get over was him talking about suffering. I can handle having to learn to love my neighbor, but now wait a minute, Jesus, you're talking about suffering? Remember in Matthew 16, it's also found in the Gospel of Mark, when Peter makes this, this claim that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, chest thrust out, I know who you are. You're the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. And then right after that, do you know what happens? Jesus starts talking about Jerusalem, that he's going to suffer. And all of a sudden, this Peter, who has claimed him the Messiah, oh, wait a minute, Lord. <laughs> the text says he rebuked Jesus. You've got a big head on your shoulders to rebuke Jesus, don't you? He rebukes Jesus because Jesus talks about suffering and death, sacrifice for the kingdom. And Jesus says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. If ever, says Jesus, there was a concept that doesn't fit into the kingdom of God, it's that you can walk the path of the kingdom and not suffer. You do know that Jesus had a choice, don't you? You do realize that, that Jesus had a choice. He could have chosen not to go to the cross. He could have chosen to avoid suffering. He could have chosen to avoid His death. Now listen to me very carefully. You may not agree with that, but I want to tell you something. If Jesus didn't have a choice, Gethsemane is a farce. The Jesus who kneels in anguish, tears, and says, If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. That's a farce if Jesus didn't have a choice. And the idea of a willing Savior for you and for me makes no sense if He couldn't choose the cross. But he did. Why did Jesus choose the cross? Because he believed that some things are worth dying for. Let me tell you what I think he believed. He believed that the love of God for all humanity is worth dying for. He believed that God's desire that all persons be treated as children of God is worth dying for. He believed that goodness and love and mercy and justice are worth dying for. He believed that God's plan for redemption of sinners is worth dying for. And guess what? He believed we're worth dying for. He believed you're worth dying for and I'm worth dying for. How about it? Is it too much to ask us moderns to be willing to sacrifice for the kingdom? Is the cross too much for us moderns? But he said, take up your cross and follow me. What sacrifice this side of crucifixion will you make and what sacrifice will I make for the sake of His kingdom? Because He did choose to continue to speak about a cross. Oh, what a great day. I mean, you know, you've got to feel good if 100,000 people line the street and wave at you and call your name. Messiah. Hosanna. Crucify. How dare he say that everyone is worth loving 
and that there is some good in everyone. How dare he offer God's grace to the blatantly immoral? And how dare he talk to us about suffering? How dare he crucify him? I'm going to invite you to take a few moments and enter in your own personal prayer time as we walk into this Holy Week and we walk toward Good Friday. Would you do that? Take a few moments in personal and private prayer, then I'll close with a prayer, and then we'll go to our closing hymn. Would you pray? Lord God, may this Holy Week 2013 be more than days on our religious calendar. May it be, O oh God, for us, by the work of your Spirit, a personal journey. May we watch our Lord. And may we listen to our master. And may we grow in commitment to the kingdom he proclaimed. Help each of us, O oh God, have this a profoundly spiritually enriching Holy Week. And we do pray it in his name and in his remembrance. Amen. Our hymn of dedication this morning is hymn number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Should there be persons in this fellowship this morning who have not committed your life to this Jesus the Christ and who would in this service make that commitment, we extend that invitation to you and encourage you in that decision. So if you're not made a commitment to Christ as Lord of your life, and today is the day to do that. You may do it privately, right where you are in the pew, between you and God. Or you may come here to this altar and share it with us publicly. If there are persons who are interested in becoming members of Germantown United Methodist Church, then I invite you to speak to Rebecca or me after the service. When I survey the wondrous cross.